This week on Phone a Friend, the Beckhams are hashtag relatable. Gwyneth Paltrow is not. Brody Jenner wants to suckle from my bosom. And Barack Obama's former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, Alyssa Mastromonaco, explains the indictments, the impeachments, the mugshots of Donald Trump, and tells me stories about meeting the Queen and the Pope. We're waiting outside the anteroom to the Pope, and I was like, I'm potentially going to shit myself and I need help. This episode is basically American politics for dummies, including questions about how Barack Obama smells. Journalism starts now. Girl, let's phone a friend with Jesse Kripschick. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Phone a Friend. I'm Jesse Cruikshank. I am back home in Los Angeles, reunited with my producer, Jason. Hi, Jason. Hi there. <gasps> JJ, I don't mean to start on a downer, but I'm going to. Okay. Because it's it's been a dark time in the world. Do you know what I mean? It has been a very hard week mm-hmm. with everything going on. And I have personally been waiting for the moment that I could record this podcast because I'm I'm literally like turning to my own podcast to help me through it. And I think that's what we can provide here, hopefully, is a little respite, a little levity amidst this very dark news cycle. Would you agree? I agree. Also, we have the most impressive guest we've ever had on, and we got the hot wiggle at the peak of his hotness. (laughs) Okay? What happened to him? Oh, he's still peaking. He's performing in Hamilton last weekend. I got so many DMs. Great. The thirsty moms are buying tickets to the Wiggles and sending me vids, and I appreciate it. I feel dirty when I get like close ups of the hot wiggle dancing on stage in, oh. in Brampton, <laughs> but I like it. Okay, so today, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff Alyssa Mastromonaco is taking my call. Even Evan was like, wait, seriously? <laughs> yes. She was the youngest woman ever to hold that role in the White House. She made history. Now she hosts this hugely popular political podcast called Hysteria. She is so smart. She is so funny, so accomplished. She's just one of these women that I've admired for a very long time. And today, I'm not just going to force her to tell me never before told stories about working with Barack Obama, but I'm essentially calling her to fill me in on what the fuck is going on with Trump. What the fuck is going on with Trump? Because admittedly, I have not been paying attention since he's been out of office. Like, at this point, I can tell you what pattern of facial hair Travis Kelsey has had for the past six years. I cannot (laughs) tell you what has been going on with the former president, possible future president, for the past six months. And there's a lot. So today, really, this is going to be like Donald Trump for dummies. We're just, you know, we're going to talk about it like real people. The impeachment, the indictments, the mugshot, the mugshot merch, the trial, Melania's new prenup. Alyssa's going to explain it all in a way that's fun, you know, and that we can understand. I didn't know there was mugshot merch. Oh, Jason, he is the Kiki Palmer of politics. Oh, gosh. The minute he took that mugshot. Oh, yes. He printed his own mugshot on T-shirts, on coffee cups, He's making money off of that arrest. I'm getting into it with Alyssa because there's an election coming up in a year. You know, this guy's not going anywhere. So I feel like I'm going to arm my phonies with everything we need to know to participate in water cooler conversation over the course of the next year. Yeah. You know, if you can't bring up like that vulva you saw last night on Naked Attraction, I'm giving you options. (laughs) I just love that we can seamlessly move from a real housewife to a white housewife. You know what I mean? That was very clever. Thank you so much. I actually just thought of it on the spot. Oh, good. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you for the feedback. Um, Jace, I just also have to apologize. <coughs> oh, my God. If I cough like a chain smoker slash like Timothee Chalamet at Beyonce, <laughs> because I came home from Toronto last week with walking pneumonia (laughs) what even is that i've heard of it but i don't yeah i don't know 
How are you feeling? Oh, please. I'm fine. I've got a Z-pack coursing through my veins. But walking pneumonia, it sounds like something an elderly person might contract. Yeah. Like if herpes goes around the bachelor mansion, walking pneumonia is what goes around the golden bachelor mansion. You know what I'm saying? What is it? Is it just from like no sleeping, planes, bus, plane, no sleep, that whole thing? Just running myself into the ground, basically. And also being surrounded by children who go to school. It's like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. This is just not something I should be experiencing in my physical prime. We need to go (laughs) try that, um, the like vitamin IV drips. I'm not Kendall Jenner, Jason. What do what, what do you th- what I can't do that. Have you ever done it? Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. It just Stop. it's like a immune boost. You just go sit in a clinic and they put an IV in your arm and then you're you're superhuman for a little while? Kind of, yeah. Like you don't walk out of there feeling like high, but you're just like very just injects you with like every nutrient possible, boosts your immune system and like cold season. Oh, I should um, I've do done that. It a couple times. <gasps> but Jason, you are the picture of health. You really are. Maybe because I've been doing this. Obviously. Okay, well, let's make me an appointment. I'm going to go because I felt particularly bad. Evan, who had been desperately waiting for me to come home and finally help with the kids. I get home and he's like yet again left alone with the kids as I lay hacking in my bed for three days. So he is a hero among us. Although I will say I took Romy to school this morning. It was the first time I had, you know, been able to do that. And one of her teachers says to the other one, I told you mommy was back. And I said, yeah, I've been back for a couple of days. They said, yeah, no, we always know when you're away. Uh. I said, oh, no, does Romy cry? And they were like, no, she's actually been pretty good. It's just, um, it's, it's her hair. We can always tell when Evan is doing her hair. And they say, it's just, it's very sweet. And like, bless his heart, it is. I don't want to make a generalization about all straight men, because Uh if you're married to a man who can do your child's hair, you've obviously found the chosen one, you know, like your partner has been touched by God. But for Evan, it's like there is a chip missing when it comes to doing my daughter's hair. And she has what can only be described as full on hockey hair. You know, like knock out her front teeth and give her a Stanley Cup (laughs) already. It's like stringy and long and tangled in the back. And then it comes down thick and blocks her eyes in the front. Like the hair cannot be left to its own devices. It is a medical concern. So I've tried to teach my husband, you know, how to complete the very difficult task of brushing it into an elastic. But Jason, it's like he has fists for hands. (laughs) He's like physically incapable of doing what I consider a fairly simple task. Do you think you could brush a child's hair into a ponytail? Oh, yeah. Right. There's like the like hair tie. Like, I don't think like a straight man can like has the hand coordination to work a a hair tie. It's like how all straight men have terrible handwriting. Like their hands just don't work in some capacities. Let's absolutely make that generalization (laughs) here on this podcast. Straight men do not have the hand-eye coordination to work a hair tie. Thank you so much, Jason. It's true. It's absolutely true. You know, you could also argue like women or at least long-haired people have more practice. I have been doing this for a lifetime. (laughs) But then I'm like, well, Evan went through that like classic straight man man bun phase during the pandemic. He should have more skills than he does. But literally, whenever I'm away, she goes to school looking like fucking Captain Hook has attempted a top (laughs) knot on like a moving toddler. There's like seven hairs have made it into an elastic that's just teetering over the front of her forehead. Forehead. It's so confusing and hilarious. And now it's how the teachers know when mommy is out of town. And so they give Romy a little extra love when the hair looks like that. And so let's just say I love him for trying. We love you for attempting. Evan, I love you for taking care of our beautiful children and for taking care of your equally beautiful wife with walking pneumonia. <clears throat> now, while I was shivering in bed on Saturday night, Jason texted me what might be the best Jason's creepy celebrity sighting photos I've <laughs> ever received. <laughs> can, can, they come in a lot like, actually, more than I like I when you line them up. It's creepy. I do feel like we need to make it a new segment. Can we? Well, now I'm going to stop doing it because it's I'm no. outing myself. No, Jason's creepy celebrity sighting photos. Insert sound effect. 
Jason's creepy celebrity sighting photo. Okay, tell our phonies who you had the honor of dining next to this weekend. The Jeff Bezos and partner Lauren Sanchez. Stop it right now. Famous for having been discussed on this podcast, obviously. For being immortalized on the front of his billion-dollar yacht. Yes. So where are you? Where are you dining that's good enough for a billionaire? Well, it wasn't. It was like, well, it was like this fancy restaurant in like Beverly Hills. I was with some friends from out of town and it was not over the top, but it was like mid-level, like nothing insane. And before they came in, this man dressed as like, literally picture Kevin Costner bodyguard, (laughs) walks through the restaurant just blatantly filming everybody with his iPhone. Like, wasn't trying to hide it. Oh. But, like, looked very in charge. Okay. Like, you're sort of like, is that a manager? Is that, like, a government official? Like, what what's happening? Right. Fast forward, maybe 30 minutes later, we see him, the same bodyguard, coming again, like, kind of ushering Jeff and Lauren, like, into their corner <sighs> booth. Yeah, and they just sat there, and I guess they just wanted to be part of the people for a Friday night. I, I don't know. I mean, those two people love to be seen. Okay, Lauren Sanchez. You think yeah. a woman who will have herself sculpted onto the front of a yacht is a kind yeah. of woman who doesn't like to be seen out and about in Beverly Hills? Of course. And like, yes, the security makes sense because, you know, sometimes shit goes down when there's a billion dollars in a mid-level restaurant in Beverly Hills. I get it. About 10 minutes after they got there, our server came over and was like, I'm so sorry, but like, we do need this table. So like, if you want to go upstairs and have dessert, like, uh, feel free. Like, kind of like, basically like, a nice way of saying, like, get the hell out of here. Right. And my friend is convinced that the video that the security guard was taking in advance was to like, deciding who was able to like, be in the restaurant <laughs> and who was not. And we like, didn't make the cut. So we were booted. <laughs> Literally, he go the security guard shows Jeff Bezos and Lauren Sanchez, who the patrons of the restaurant, and they yeah. were like, Yeah, get rid of him, get rid of him, keep the rest. Yeah. <gasps> it's a possibility. It's a possibility, and I think we should go with it. It's you were not <laughs> yeah. qualified to be in the same room as Lauren and Jeff. Oh, Jason. This is one of Jason's best creepy celebrity sightings ever. Jason's creepy celebrity sighting photo. Great sighting, Jason. Keep doing things on weekends in Los Angeles, okay? (laughs) You're doing God's work for us here on this show. You've been rubbing elbows with billionaires while I've been rubbing VapoRub into my lungs. Jason, it's been a week. (laughs) It's been a week. Yeah. Okay, after sleeping all day, I needed something to get me through my feverish nights, and that something was Beckham, the new documentary series on Netflix about David and Victoria Beckham. You haven't watched yet, right, Jay? I haven't. It's on my list. Too busy going to hot restaurants with real friends. Okay. (laughs) I have watched the first two episodes. I feel like it's either a sports documentary with Spice Girls on the side or a Spice Girls documentary with sports on the side. Depends on how you look at it. Either way, made for perfect co-viewing. Okay, Evan was happy to watch it with me because it's about David Beckham's soccer career. And that part is great. I mean, it's fascinating. But the relationship dynamic between David and Victoria is the best part. And after the first two episodes, I have three key takeaways. Okay, so number one, David Beckham and Victoria Beckham, two of the wealthiest, most beautiful people on the planet, are relatable. Relatable. So you've seen the clip where he calls her out for pretending to be working class, right? Yeah. We're very working, working class. Be honest. I I am being honest. honest. I am being what honest. What did your dra- dad drive you to school in? So my dad. Did, no, one answer. My dad. What well, car was it? Uh, it's not a simple answer what because. What car? What did you get your dad to drive? It you depends. To school in? No, 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 no. Okay, what in car? the eighties, my dad had a Rolls Royce. Thank you. I mean, the comedic timing of that clip is unprecedented. No, it's so good. And I would have believed her, too. Yes! Uh, So, now we have the truth. But you kind of get the sense that you're actually getting the truth in this documentary because he does this with her throughout the doc. Like, he pokes fun at her, he calls her out on her shit, he, like, makes her tell the truth when she's saying little lies. They have a very funny back and forth. Is she, like, playing it for the Netflix cameras? Like, she's trying to, like... 
put on a different persona and he keeps calling it out. I think that's just their dynamic as husband and wife. Do you know what I mean? Like there's one time where she's like, okay, I'm going to work. And he goes, work, seriously, where are you going? And she's like, I'm going to work. He's like, come on. And she goes, I'm going to a facial. (laughs) Like he's constantly just calling her out when she's, yeah, like maybe putting it on for the cameras a little bit. There's this moment where Evan really felt seen when David Beckham is talking about the cleanliness of his stove. Listen to this. It's pretty clean because I clean it so well. And I'm not sure it's actually appreciated so much by my wife, in all honesty. The fact that when everyone's in bed, I then go around, clean the candles, turn the lights on to the right setting, make sure everywhere's tidy because I hate coming down in the morning and there's cups and plates and, you know, bowls. It's tiring. That's what happens. Oh, you are appreciated. Yeah. You go. All right. That's Victoria Beckham in the background being like, you are appreciated. (laughs) He's like, okay. And I don't know if it's just my relationship, but Evan is absolutely that guy. Like, He's the one who stays up late, cleaning the stove, turning off the lights, making sure everything is ready for the next morning. He's a real caretaker like that. And in that moment, in that documentary, he felt so seen. And I personally saw myself in Victoria Beckham just sitting in the corner going, I appreciate it. (laughs) (laughs) That's us. You know, we are the Beckhams, Jason. Basically. Basically. Relatable. Number two, David Beckham was the Britney Spears of his time. Hear me out. I did not know any of this. So he gets a red card in a World Cup match that England eventually loses. And then he becomes the most hated man in the country. Did you know that? I didn't know that either. Me neither. I thought it was all just like, bend it like Bex, posh and Bex. I was only ever pro Beckham. But no, for like a full year at 23 years old, he's bullied, he's threatened, he's slandered like all through the press with no regard for his well-being or mental health. Meanwhile, when Victoria Beckham would go to his games, the crowd of 75,000 people would try to taunt him by chanting, I'm going to let her say it. Posh bias takes it up the Excuse my language, not very ladylike, but 75,000 people singing that. I mean, it's embarrassing, it's hurtful. I remember sitting down and the lady next to me, she turned to me, she didn't know what to say. She said, do you want a polo? Do I want a polo? Because no, what what do you say when you're sitting next to someone and 75,000 people have been saying that you take it up the Okay, translation, a polo is a breath mint. (laughs) I had to Google. Someone offered her a breath mint after 75,000 people were chanting, Posh Spice takes it up the ass. Actually, I'm just going to go on record and say, not that big of an insult. Almost impressive, (laughs) if I'm being honest. Which brings us to number three. My final takeaway is that David Beckham is the hottest middle-aged man that has ever walked the face of this earth. When you see shots of him in his 20s at his peak, he was fine. But at his mid, he's finer. He's out here sipping tea in chunky knits with perfect stubble, being shot in extreme close-ups, Jason. Like, naked attraction (laughs) penis-style close-ups. Sadly, no penis, all face. But what a face! It's perfectly weathered. He's like covered in tattoos. He's vulnerable and honest. And I'd be in love with him if I wasn't so in love with them. Are Victoria and David Beckham the great love story of our time? Are Posh and Bex our generations Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart? (laughs) I mean, name a more lasting love. You cannot. Not Will and Jada. Not Will and Jada, no, hot off the press. They have been living separate lives since 2016. I mean, some people are like, well, what about Amal and George? No, they haven't been together this long. They don't have four grown children, no. It's Posh and Bex. There's a scene that I haven't seen yet. It's coming up in the next two episodes where they're like doing a line dance. I mean, I love them. Like they do like 
activities? No. On weeknights? <laughs> no, they're like, uh, no, they don't worry. They don't leave the property. Okay. Wherever they're shooting them, it's like some grand property with beehives and sprawl. It's a sprawling estate and they oh. never leave. But there is a scene where they're doing like a line dance to islands in the stream, like in their kitchen. And it's adorable. In conclusion, highly recommend the documentary Beckham if you love sports and or Spice Girls. Related. This is a sidebar, but related. When Evan and I were first dating, he was living in New York City. You remember this? I was working at MTV in Toronto. Mm -hmm. He would come to visit me on occasion. One time he comes to visit me one weekend, and I'm so excited because I had tickets for us to see the Spice Girls in concert. I did not realize the concert was on Super Bowl Sunday, which was a problem for Evan, who, as we learned last week— Likes football. Mm -hmm. He's since told me that after a long, deep internal struggle, he finally decided to skip the Super Bowl to come see the Spice Girls with me. And to this day, he says that's the moment he knew it was love. He says that's when he knew this little hussy up in Canada was the real deal. You know? So sweet. So sweet. What's next? What's next? Wait, have I told you my David Beckham story, Jason? No. I have encountered him IRL. Oh, I don't. No, no, no. Definitely not. Do you want to hear it? Sure. Yes. We're going off track, but okay. So I'm eight plus months pregnant with twins. At this point, we had an induction scheduled and I had like, I, I was allowed to only walk a few steps a day. I was on bed rest. I was huge. So my best friend takes me out for lunch two days before my induction. It's going to be like our last moment as best friends without children in the mix. So we go to the Sycamore Kitchen on La Brea. Do you know that little restaurant? No, I haven't heard of it. Oh, cute. I'm shocked. I'm sure <laughs> Jeff and Lauren have dined there. Um, so we go to the Sycamore Kitchen and we park in the valet. Listen, I'm cheap. I'm going to look for street parking all day, but I also have like 40 steps I'm allowed to take a day. So I yeah. park in the valet. We go for lunch. We're walking back to the valet, which is behind the restaurant off of a side street. I am waddling heavy, large, and like an apparition walking towards us from the valet comes David Beckham holding hands with his young daughter. Aww. And as he's approaching, I'm so large, I can hardly move out <laughs> of the way of the sidewalk. I'm like, well, I can hardly breathe. I know it's David Beckham. He walks right up to me. He looks at me. He smiles and he says, congratulations, <gasps> and then walks past. And in that moment, I like, I, I almost gave birth. I mean, my water almost broke. <laughs> right. I'm surprised he did it. I, I, I would have had him pull them out of me, honestly. Wow. I was mostly regretful that I didn't ask him for a photo because I, you don't never want to ask a celebrity for a picture when they're with their child, but it felt like of all times. I know. I'm a. About to go into labor. We're on a quiet side street by a valet. I probably could have got a pic. But listen, David Beckham blessed my twins. Yeah. And as a result, they are f absolutely fucking insane six-year-olds. So thanks, <laughs> Bex. Let's move on. Gwyneth Paltrow is the overpriced gift that keeps on giving. First, she gives us her ski accident trial. She gives us I wish you well. She gives us bone broth and Ben Affleck's penis and a fridge full of lotion all in one year. Now she's out here blessing us with a 73 questions video for Vogue. I could talk about her answers to all 73 questions, but instead I'll trim it down to five questions from Gwyneth's 73 questions. Five questions from Gwyneth's 73 questions. And number five, while standing in her vegetable garden that looks like I'm going to say an elevated Home Depot garden center. She answers a question about her favorite recipe. What is a go-to recipe that you're excited about? Um, well, lately I've been using all this gorgeous lettuce, so lots of salads with delicious proteins and really cooking from the land. Mmm. I, too, have been cooking from the land. Food land, that is. Well, Gwyneth is out here talking about eating homegrown bib lettuce with, quote, delicious proteins. I'm watching this while snacking on popcorn that I didn't even pop. I bought it already popped, salted, <laughs> buttered, packaged into a bag. Like farm to processed food factory to table. Do you ever get those, like, sweet and salty pre-popped popcorn always, bags? The always. Best. Jason, I don't think I've popped my own popcorn for at least seven years. <laughs> yeah. 
cooking from the land. At number four, we get into vices. Don't we all want to know what Gwyneth does wrong? If someone were to ask me what my biggest vice is, I'd say like, you know, drinking too much wine, drinking before 4 p.m. on weekends, not exercising, eating candy, eating that pre-packaged sweet and salty popcorn straight out of the bag, (laughs) staying up late watching Gwyneth Paltrow's 73 questions. I have 73 answers to that question. When he asked Gwyneth, she said this. What's your biggest vice? My one alcoholic drink a week. Her one alcoholic drink a week. I mean, this was a little disappointing. You know this yeah. is a pro-Gwyneth podcast, Jason, but I, I thought Gwyneth was a homie, a healthy homie. But like when I applied to have dinner with her in her wine cellar at her Airbnb, which I did <laughs> not win, I assumed we'd be drinking the wine. But now I know I would have just been sitting there drinking alone. Yeah. So I'm glad I didn't get that (laughs) Airbnb night. Can you just picture her sitting alone at a 16-foot dining table with like a linen napkin on her lap, having her one alcoholic drink a week, just like taking a slow sip of a Californian craft cider? But really, it's probably just kombucha. Let's be honest. That's her one alcoholic drink. It's slightly disappointing. So let's move on to my third favorite question. What's your favorite curse word? Favorite curse word, fuck ass. (laughs) It's not just the speed at which she answers fuck ass. It's that she's in this (laughs) ethereal purple dress. She's like holding a wicker basket full of fresh cut flowers and vegetables from the (laughs) land and just casually yells fuck ass. (laughs) <laughs> Have you ever heard of the term fuck ass, Jay? Not so like competently like that, like as if it was a definitive term. No, I, d- I, I don't believe it is. In, in fact, it is my mission to inform people here on this podcast. Yeah. So I Googled it. And, and once okay. I got past all the porn, FYI, yeah. don't Google fuck ass. <laughs> don't Google I found ass. an urban dictionary definition. So apparently fuck ass means someone who's arrogant, annoying, an asshole, and just a complete idiot. Fabulous. Lovely. Fuck ass. But it doesn't stop there. Wait for question number two. I also know that you're a polyglot. Can you say anything in any language? Uh, Fiche-moi la paix. Oh, that sounds beautiful. It means leave me the fuck alone. (laughs) Rude, but make it chic. And finally, my number one moment from Gwyneth's 73 questions is this. What a beautiful Academy Award. (laughs) My doorstop. It works perfectly. She is using her Academy Award as a doorstop, not even in the home, but to hold open a backyard gate outside (laughs) of the home, which really just brings this full circle. This is the essence of why I love Gwyneth, because she's trolling us, Jason, She knows us poors are going to get our Kirkland underpants in a bunch over this, and she gives it to us anyways. (laughs) To her, it's just, it's funny. It's like, she's like, oh, I'm just going to do this little Oscar bit, and it'll be hilarious. But even her comedy is unhuman and unrelatable. (laughs) You know? I didn't think about it that it's like literally it's literally her like back creaky gate that it's her it back works. like listen, you're gonna you're gonna have this from the vestibule into the sitting room. Sure, I'll buy it. But this is her back garden gate. Like who cares that her fellow performers are on the picket lines fighting for their livelihood every day? She is using the craft of acting's highest honor to prop the back gate open <laughs> to her Hamptons home. Thanks, Gwyneth. I wish you well. I wish you well. Some women sleep in silk lingerie. I sleep in a pool of my own anxiety-induced sweat. It's time for another edition of What's Giving Me Night Sweats. Good, what's giving me the night sweats? What's giving me night sweats? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for this because there are a few things that have been keeping me up at night this week. Let's begin with Britney Spears posting yet another dancing in underwear in her living room video. But this time, it wasn't with knives. It was with a decorated Christmas tree in the background. Jason, this is not okay with me. To have your Christmas tree up and decorated, it's not even mid-October. Her fans 
fans sent police officers to her house when she danced with knives. Can we do a wellness check on her for this, too? I've barely put up my Halloween decorations. Like, did she just flagrantly skip, I hate myself for saying this, spooky season? Yeah. And go straight to holiday season? What happened to It's Britney Witch? It's Britney Witch? Jason, uh-huh. I saw this and went immediately to you, an expert in the Britney field. Yeah. Wondering if maybe this was an old video that she's just posting now, but you did confirm that these hair extensions are new. So it must be current. Is that correct? <laughs> correct. And people always drag her for like posting old photos and videos. So now she'll always say, this is new. This is from three months ago. She oh. gives us like the timestamp. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. So listen, here's the question. When is it okay to put up Christmas decorations? I would say December 1st. December 1st. Yeah. Yes. Thank oh, okay. You, you agree. I was thought that was going to be like wildly too late, but... I do feel like there's, there are different rules. Like I feel like in Canada, I'll accept post-Halloween because you've already had Thanksgiving, so might as well move it along. In America, it's post-Thanksgiving. It's December 1st. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like after Halloween, you can set out some festive gourds, perhaps a cornucopia... Until yeah. Thanksgiving is over, and then you can smash right into Christmas. I mean, be my guest. Like, get the Mariah Carey pumping. But anything before that is unacceptable. Although, because I only want the best for Brittany, if she needs to feel the spirit of Christmas while dancing in a thong in October, <laughs> I wish her well. I wish you well. Next, hot dad Brody Jenner just posted a YouTube video of himself making a latte. As you do. He wakes up in the morning looking perfect. But when he realizes that he's out of almond milk instead of running down to the Malibu Country Mart, he decides to make the latte with his fiance's breast milk. Now, I hear great things about breast milk. I hear it's very nutritious. I hear it's very delicious. I think it'll do. It's freaking delicious. Delicious. I'm not sure it is. <laughs> Listen. Don't get me wrong. If Brody Jenner wants breast milk in his coffee, he can come on down to my house and suckle directly from this teat any day of the week. Because my toddler doesn't need this milk to survive, okay? She is thriving on mac and cheese and white bread. But his newborn is going to need that milk. Like, I'm all for tasting your partner's breast milk. I love how nonchalant he is about trying it. I mean, go ahead and normalize it, BJ. But We aren't talking about just a drop in the coffee. He is full-on frothing it in the espresso machine. It's half a bag of frothed and warmed breast milk. He's made a latte with his (laughs) partner's liquid gold. Jason. Yeah? You said you would not appear naked on television for less than a billion dollars last week. How much to drink a latte made from my frothed breast milk? Oh, God. Um... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like it's i i have like a queasy stomach it would be high more than a million i mean do i have to drink the whole thing you have to drink the whole thing but it has been warmed and frothed okay um i mean like it's come straight I would go from like, my teeth like i would go like six figures Jason, yeah. I might have the to make this better, happen. But like, <laughs> I could suck it up. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I just want to just go on the record and say uh, we are mere minutes from calling a former White House chief of staff, and I just asked you about drinking my breast milk. Yeah. It's a journey. It's a journey. <laughs> Let's move on to the final thing that's giving me night sweats. Arnold Schwarzenegger has been promoting his new self-help book simply titled Be Useful. (laughs) It's all about getting tough, working hard, and being useful, I I guess. His approach isn't really for the faint of heart. He's against all the, quote, woo-woo manifestation (laughs) mumbo-jumbo and thinks our generation is just a bunch of wimps, as he told Howard Stern. Don't start creating a generation of wimps and weak people and stuff like that, where we go into be concerned about how are you feeling today? Oh, I don't want to hurt your feelings. Let's not over baby the kids and let's not over baby kind of the people. I mean, let's go and teach kids 
to be tough, to go out and do sports, to go and study, to struggle, and, you know, to go through this kind of painful moment sometimes. I mean, yeah, why worry about our feelings when we can play sport and struggle, you wimps? No, it's so good. <laughs> That's not even what is giving me night sweats. Like, I don't care that he's saying that stuff. What's bothering me is that everyone reacting to this clip is like, for shame, how dare this man spread toxic masculinity? Guys, this man started toxic masculinity. He is the embodiment of the classic 90s, like, manly action hero. He's killed so many people with his bare hands. He makes Steven Seagal look like a wimp. A wimp. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what people expected. Like, did people expect him to say, like, I'll be back with a new feminist perspective? No. So let it go and enjoy Arnold Schwarzenegger being classic Arnold Schwarzenegger. You wimps. And now I'm going to get night sweats just thinking about my accent. That was <laughs> terrible. I'm so sorry. And that's what's giving me night sweats. Good what's giving me the night sweats. What's giving me night sweats. Whew. I will say this. Arnold Schwarzenegger is possibly the reason Donald Trump became president, yeah. right? He was a celebrity-turned-Republican politician. Yeah. He sort of paved the way for someone like Donald Trump to even have a shot at the Oval Office. And now Trump is trying to get into the Oval Office again. He's leading in the polls by a landslide, despite being impeached twice, indicted four times, has 91 felony charges against him, had a mugshot taken, a prenup ordered, and is currently on trial for fraud. And yet could still become president next year. You can, my arms are flailing. The walking pneumonia is running. Like, I don't understand it, Jason. My main question is like, what the fuck is happening? And when I have questions, I get to phone a friend. Girl, let's phone a friend. I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. I am calling Barack Obama's former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, Alyssa Mastromonaco. She was the youngest woman to ever hold that position. She's since become a New York Times bestselling author, a political podcaster. She's smart. She's funny. And I just hope she answers my basic questions without judgment. Hello? Hello, Alyssa Mastromonaco. Um, I'm sorry. Who is this? Is this spam? The, no, please don't hang up, please. <laughs> Hi, this is Jesse Cruikshank. I am calling you from a little podcast called Phone a Friend. Just a little podcast, just, just a little a tiny little podcast. podcast. Oh, please, says the host of a gigantic podcast that I have been listening to for so many years. Thank you for taking my call, Alyssa. We, listen, I'm here to provide any guidance, a little deeper, shallow as it may be. Mm, can I tell you this? You are absolutely my most impressive phone a friend, and I have had Hot Wiggles, Housewives, and Chris Kirkpatrick on this show. Uh, so. You had De Moi on too, didn't I you? I had De Moi too. <laughs> yes. Oh, stop! You do not follow De Moi. I I absolutely do. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I didn't think I could like or respect you more, but I do now. Sometimes when they go deep on the Kardashians or like if they have too many blind quote, you know, yeah. too many. Yeah, I'm I like, like, I don't yes. know, you no, guys. I don't have the brain power to figure out. Uh, yeah, but there's I do, too much else I do, going on. When the world is quite dark and I need a little respite, I definitely enjoy that, that uh, account. And that's what this is all about, isn't it? Just giving the people Honestly. a little respite when the world is dark. You know what gave me a little respite when I was going through all of your accolades and I found this. When you were President Obama's White House Deputy Chief of Staff, you were on the New Republic magazine's list of, quote, Washington's most powerful, least, least famous, famous people. Oh. <laughs> It's the greatest thing to be. I think. It was, I felt fairly baller when that came out. I was like, oh, really? Yeah. Actually, I was so powerful, but least, least known that Ebony Magazine actually accidentally called me a rising star. Hey. And I was like, do they know that I'm a white lady? And of course, it was immediately corrected by them. But I will tell you, <laughs> President Obama got a good laugh out of that one. They thought that you were a young black woman working in the White House? They did. Literally, I was just a ghost that no one had ever seen. And oh, nobody had any idea. 
I'm obsessed. You know, I think it is better to have power than fame, right? Like, isn't that the ultimate? Because Chris Kirkpatrick can't make decisions on Air Force One. You know what I mean? No. I mean, it's like, look, power is great, especially if you use it in the right ways. Mm -hmm. But fame, yikes, just makes you a target. (laughs) Absolutely. Can I just side note? If you were currently working in the White House, would you insist that the president sign an executive order forcing InSync to go on tour? Isn't InSync exactly what we need right now? Thank you, Alyssa. I was behind a presidential statement to commemorate the death of Donna Summer when it happened. Did he actually make one? Yeah. And that was your doing? It was Valerie Jarrett and myself were both like, just wait a minute. She's an icon. And the thing is, it was like a group. It was a group discussion we were having. But when she and I went to uh, the president, he was like, obviously, Donna Summer. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. You're getting real inside baseball today. Already. So, but this is why I'm phoning you, and trust me, I'm going to insist that you give me way more inside baseball. But it really, I like, I, I, I've been listening to your podcast, Hysteria, for years. But admittedly, after Trump lost the election in 2020, I have sort of allowed myself to detox. Good for you. From Good for American you. political news. Thank you. Good for you. Trump uh, news has been replaced with Demois in my algorithm, and I'm sort of been okay with that. But then in the past few months, there's been indictment after indictment. There's a mugshot. There's nine. 91 felony counts against him. He's in court literally as we speak. Yeah. I don't even really know why. And so I am phoning you, Alyssa, for help. This is my favorite. I'm going to ask you some very stupid questions. Of course. Because I'm coming at this. My excuse is like, I'm Canadian. I haven't been paying enough attention. Can you just promise me that there is no such thing as a stupid question? No such thing. Not possible. Not possible. Thank you so much. Um, Before we dive in, I just want to make sure that you are on the same page as me. Can you tell me one stupid thing you did whilst at the White House? Okay. So I'm going to tell you something that I'm not sure if I've ever talked (gasps) about it, but I don't know if it's as much stupid as it is embarrassing, but I'm just going to go for it. It's an exclusive. Go on. It's an exclusive. Mm. So... Uh, it was a Friday afternoon. Okay. We were going to a fundraiser, leaving the White House, get on to Marine One. And as we get off of Marine One in th- at this fundraiser in Virginia, one of the military aides comes up to me and they're like, ma'am, you split your skirt. <laughs> and I was like, what? They're like, you split your skirt. Your skirt is split c- clear up the back. <gasps> now- To say that I, it was like my job to run the 18 acres of the White House, that that was part of my job description. Sure. To have the people who in theory reported to me be like, girl, your ass is literally showing. (laughs) So I'm like, what do I do? I have to get through this whole event. And it was, it was like a pencil skirt. And so the military doctors who tended to the president had to find all of their pins, all the bobby pins they could find. No. And like Humpty Dumpty, they put me no. back together again. And that's why they are world-renowned <laughs> heroes in our midst. And so when I get into the, we, we, I, I get back into the car to get back to the helicopter and I'm like laying on my side because you know, if you sit properly down, you're going to split the pins. Like the pins oh, are going to yeah, go right you up can't your butt. Sit. No, you're standing the rest of the day. But then I were like getting onto Marine One and I'm with the president and I'm like sitting in a different seat than usual, which was more like a bench seat. So I could kind of like lean over. He's like, what on God's earth are you doing? What is actually wrong with you? I was like, here's the deal. I split my skirt, not because it was too tight, because it was poorly made. And I'm like, and I, if I sit up, I'm going to break all of the pins. And I'm not going to lie. That was a story that stayed between us. God bless him. Um, But it was without question the most embarrassed I had ever been. My butt was just old underwear, old (laughs) Hanes her way underwear. Not ready. Just popping through the (gasps) seams. I love that so much. Do you know why? Like, I famously. Thank you. You're welcome. No, just go ahead, stand up, babe. Whatever you need to do. I famously split my pleather pants (gasps) during an interview with. 
American Idol runner-up Adam Lambert, which might not no. sound as consequential as doing no, it. No, that's with consequential. The Pleather is but real. It shrinks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And it was too tight, if I'm being honest. I shoved myself into that to be respected by Adam Lambert. And there I was, literal vision exposed to the world for the duration of the interview. So see, we've all been there. We're normalizing there. talking about wardrobe <sighs> malfunctions. We sure are. It's a public service. You have done a few other things that have really normalized a lot of, you, you know, bodily functions, oh, et cetera, yeah. during your time as Barack Obama's deputy chief of staff. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard about them. I'd like to get into details in a game I am calling Alyssa Explains It All. Okay. Alyssa Explains It All. I'm going to tell you three things that allegedly happened to you during your time in the White House. You explain it all as quickly as possible. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. <sighs> You stole something from Buckingham Palace? I did indeed. <gasps> I had dressed incorrectly, didn't realize I was going to Buckingham Palace, was in oh. jeans and a tweed blazer, was so no. nervous sitting in the ante room that I accidentally, trying to cover, be, look busy so no one would pay attention to me, yes. I, I stole uh, the Tatler, I, a copy of the Tatler. And you took that home with you. I did. And it was never returned to Buckingham. And did you meet the queen in jeans? No, I didn't meet the queen in jeans. I met her the evening before in a proper outfit. Thank God. Okay, when you met the queen, mm-hmm. just follow up. Meghan Markle famously did not learn to curtsy before meeting the queen. Did you learn? We had a low-key, like, uh, Alyssa, here's what you have to do. So I did a, a, a semi-curtsy bow. It wasn't great, but I think for, like, an American public servant, it was acceptable. Oh, love that. Okay, next. Mm. Not only were you the youngest woman ever to hold your position in the White House, you had the first tampon dispenser installed in the West Wing. Can you believe we didn't have a tampon dispenser? No! It was crazy. It used (gasps) to be this real sort of communal thing where women would just leave tampons in the bathroom. And when I became deputy chief, I thought, you know, it's funny. It's It's a lifelong lesson. Always ask the question because I assumed there was some reason we couldn't have one. And security issues, anything, quarters, I don't know. And so when I asked the question, I was like, everyone's like, no, there's no reason we can't have a tampon dispenser. So we had one. My favorite part was announcing it in our morning staff meeting where I met, like, made some people very uncomfortable when I was like, groundbreaking for the tampon dispenser on the ground floor. And everyone was like, what? That's crazy. And I did hear, I did hear that after we left the administration, the tampon dispenser broke and was not repaired during a certain four-year period. That's gossip. I don't know if it's true, but I did, I did hear it from a few sources. Wow. The women of the Trump White House did not repair the tampon dispenser. Hmm. Okay. Finally, this is a sentence I truly feel honored to say. Okay. You had diarrhea whilst meeting the Pope? Sure did. Oh, my God. Sure did. I suffer from IBS. I do, too. Go on. It is something that has gotten has gotten worse as I've gotten older. It's really sexy, though. I think people really like to hear about Again, it. Again, can we normalize it? Like, shouldn't we have Thank bracelets you. that let people, like, <laughs> medic alert bracelets that are like, listen, can you just, like, let me into your bathroom, please? I promise <laughs> it'll be okay. Um, <gasps> yes, we were going to see the Pope that morning. One of the things you have to do. If you're a woman going to see the Pope, you have to put a mantilla, black veil on your head. And my roommate of a few years was putting the mantilla on my head. And she's like, AM, do not eat those eggs. She's like, you know how eggs can upset your stomach. But the thing is, when you travel with the president, sometimes you don't know when your next meal is going to be. You're like, I may not eat again until I get back to the hotel. And I was like, these are scrambled. They'll be okay. (laughs) They were scrambled with some amount of dairy or cream in them. Mm. And... We're waiting outside the ante room to the Pope, and I had to go to the doctor. We have a, we travel with a doctor, and uh-huh. I was like, I'm I am potentially going to shit myself, and I need like, I need help. And so it was a <laughs> full staff. Everybody was on board to help me. They found Imodium, like extra strength Imodium, and then they finally brought me water. And I was like, Where did the water come from? And like. I have always liked to think that I had holy water, which I swallowed my emodium with, which is why I didn't actually shit the Pope. <laughs> and that is how Alyssa explains it all. That's it. Alyssa explains it all. 
Oh my God! You are one of us. If we somehow got jobs at the White House and were allowed into the Vatican, listen, wow. we should wow. normalize. I have always told people: if you have any sort of like IBS, any sort of issue. It is only worse if you hide it because then the anxiety when you get that low key grumble in the tumble and you're like, it's coming. The worst thing to do is is get stressed about it because it makes it worse. Well, you're kind of also just making me realize that I now need to travel with a team who can provide me with gas, uh, gas, gas, amodium, and holy water when necessary. You know, see, yeah. we're here to help. Oh God, all of those stories, by the way, I should mention, are in your first book, which is called "Who Thought This Was a Good yes. Idea." Yes, on the cover of that book, mm-hmm. you are sitting on—is it Air Force One? Air Force is One. It, okay. With Barack Obama perched on the armrest of your chair. And that is not the first time I have seen him perched on the armrest of your chair. And I just need to know, like, is that just his thing? He's just sitting inches away from your lap. Is that the relationship you had? Like, I'm fascinated by it. He's a chair percher. He loves a chair perch. Yes. Also, because it means he's not settling in to sit with us. Like the chair perch is like, I'm coming in to say hi. We're going to talk a couple minutes and then I'm going to leave you you four to your devices. Oh my God. The chair perch is strategic on behalf it's of a busy person. It's non-committal. Yes. yes. I'm here. I'm present, but I'm not pulling up a chair and we're not going into this right now. We're not. <gasps> I'm not sitting here for the rest of the night. I love that. I might have to start perching. I'm a perch. Like when my husband wants to tell me about football, I'm just, I'm going to perch. I'm you should perch, perch because now. then you can like slowly stand up. Yeah. You can back up I towards gotta, the kitchen yeah. and start multitasking. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Now we have to sadly move on from President Obama to sure. President Trump. Like it's 2016 all over mm. again. Mm. So you said there are no stupid questions. Yes. So can I just start with the most basic of yes. questions? Which is... Alyssa, this man was impeached twice in office. Mm -hmm. A historic achievement, really, for him. And I thought, like, oh, we got him. No. But then he's acquitted of all charges. Nothing happens. And now he's just totally free to run for president again. So those impeachments were meaningless? So he was impeached by the House, but not convicted by the United States Senate. Right. Problematic. So therefore, he was impeached. It's a mark on his record. You know, it's kind of like you're in high school. You've got a demerit. It should reasonably be more severe than that. But that's what it kind of feels like now. And actually, Jesse, I can tell you something that's even a smidgy more disturbing. Go on. If convicted in these multiple cases yeah. in over 90 charges. Yeah. There's nothing in our constitution that says he can't actually still go on and be president and ultimately pardon himself from several of the federal charges. This is so upsetting and crazy because, yes, he has 91 charges yeah. against him for indictments. And mm-hmm. just clarify, please, for my phonies, what is an indictment? Uh it means they found enough that a grand jury or someone yeah. found enough evidence that they're like, yeah, this can go to trial. Okay, which is serious when serious. you're a former, Listen, former president. If yes. I were indicted for something, please, I, anyone who gets, you'd be fucking shitting your, literally without even you having IBS, you'd be shitting your pants. At the Vatican, everywhere, palace, at the all at over the grocery the place. store, at the gas Please. station, you'd be unwell if you had. And been you don't indicted. even need to have IBS to be shitting yourself. No, nope, you get indicted. No, nope, okay. nope. the average gotcha. Joe should be shitting themselves if they're indicted for things, especially things like this. And and the things are, by the way, there's like storing classified documents or deleting or, you know, trying to delete camera footage at his Mar-a-Lago estate. There's yep. charges around the hush money he paid to Stormy Daniels. There's a feminist hero. January 6th espionage, yeah. you know, violations mm-hmm. of the Espionage Act. I mean, these are not small things. Which is the most serious of the charges? Like, are there any which could I think the espionage. Well, here's the thing. The Espionage Act, I think, is probably the most, like, Jesus fucking Christ. Like, I mean, like, like <laughs> yes. the Espionage Act. But it is also, it's a federal, it is a federal indictment. And so he could, in theory, pardon himself if he became president. But I think, I think a president violating any tenant of the Espionage Act is catastrophic. Catastrophic. Yeah. But, but. But yeah, I 
can't even form sentences. It, it, it fills me with rage and diarrhea. Like, I can't volunteer to read a book in my own child's kindergarten class if I have any kind of a criminal record. Right. But this man can just run for president. There are so many things that enrage me about uh, about everything that he is he's been indicted for. But the classified documents case yeah. is actually one that's just so outrageous because oh. when I so back in 20, 2009, it's inauguration day after working so hard for Barack Obama since he was a United States senator. Do you know who didn't go to inauguration? Me. You know why? <gasps> because I admitted on my, it's called the SF-86. It is the security document. It is uh -huh. of very many pages. And I was like, yeah, I smoke weed. You know, the worst thing you can do on these, on these documents is lie. Because fundamentally, sure. lying means you are untrustworthy and potentially that there's something you could be blackmailed over, which makes you not fit for service. Fair. I admitted so it all. Said, yes. I, I said I smoked weed. I went to the okay. University of Vermont. I went to the University Please. of Wisconsin. Okay. Guess what? And for years, my IBS didn't affect me, unbeknownst <laughs> to me, because I was smoking weed and it calmed, hey. it calmed my belly down. Wow. So, but when you get into the government, one, I had to get drug tested on and off for random drug tested for two years. Okay. <gasps> Because I admitted that I harmlessly smoked weed, okay? Yes. I get into the, get you sworn in, and part of what you have to do is get a briefing on how to handle classified information from the most senior person to the most junior person. One of the first things that you are indoctrinated with is how to treat classified information. Uh -huh. And every morning when I became deputy chief of staff, I got a look book, I got a read book rather, that was thick. It was like a, it was like a novella uh -huh. and it was about all the bad things happening around the world. And you know what happened after you flipped through it and you read it, you put what? it in a burn bag and it got burned because it was classified and you didn't physically burned, physically burned. If I left, for example, if I got the book and then had to run to a meeting, if a security officer found it on my desk open and unattended, you got a violation. OK, so there is nobody who works in the White House that doesn't understand how it works. Fast forward however many years, he had a bathroom full of boxes and boxes of classified information. That's wild. Yeah. So yeah, to me, no, that one really is like, it into no. perspective. Yeah. OK. OK. So finally, with the fourth indictment, mm. we got a mugshot, which is the first ever mugshot taken of an American president. Yes. Talk to me about his strategy going into that historic photograph. So I think that his strategy was, I am not going to let the media weaponize this against mm. me. I'm going to put my face on mugs. I'm going to put it on T-shirts. I'm going to make some motherfucking money off of this mugshot, which is what he did. Before he even took it, you think that was the strategy? I do. I do. Because in less than 24 hours, he was selling merch. Yeah. Um, did you get the coffee mug or the water bottle or Definitely the not tea? because I don't need night terrors. <laughs> <laughs> He's just so good at weaponizing all of this. Yeah. I think that, like, those, those literal mugs are the scariest part, is that he's taking all of these really these crimes that he's being accused yes. of and turning them into fodder for his base to get excited, even more excited around him. Yes. He now claims that with every indictment, every trial, every mugshot, it makes his popularity grow in the polls. Which is, Do we which is bearing is out. I mean, it is kind of bearing out since all of this, you know, since probably I'd say July, uh, his popularity has gone up. He plays... It's, it's an incredible thing when you think about it. He is uh -huh. both the richest man, self-made, all this stuff he tells his followers. However, he is literally the crooked person he warns them against. Mm. And he is making money off of these people buying his mug, which, by the way, worth noting, all the money he's raising, a huge percentage of it is being used to pay his legal bills. Wow. Mm -hmm. Uncool. 
uncool. And now, okay, so I, I guess I'm just like still trying to find out if there is any way that the legal system can stop this man from being president okay. again. Because now there are cases, like some of these cases, there are trials that are set for yes. May of 2024. The election would be in November 2024. Yes. Can he run for office if he is on trial? Yes. In some weird way, the circumstances kind of low-key align in his favor. Mm. He's so far ahead of Ron DeSantis in the polls and everybody mm-hmm. else, Vivek Ramaswamy, Nikki Haley. I mean, I think that the last thing I heard is if you combined the poll numbers of the everybody beneath him, he's still winning. Oh, my God. So That's terrifying. go back to a normal presidential election. Normally, during a primary, candidates are out there hustling. Yeah. He doesn't have to do that. He's got the support. He's going to win so many of these primaries. He doesn't have to do that, number one. Number two, mm. then he's running against a sitting president. In general, sitting presidents campaign less yeah. than an, a, a non-incumbent, a challenger. Right. So it's a little easier for him. If he's found guilty mm-hmm. and he gets prison time, he could still run slash become president and then pardon himself? It seems possible. This is wild. Like, it seems like there's nothing in the letter of the law Mm. that says if he had been convicted of impeachment, he couldn't. Got it. Got it. But that is the, that appears to be the one uh, real barrier to entry. And that, as we know, that ship has sailed. So this man could be found guilty, could be sentenced to up to 20 years in prison yeah. and still become the president of the United States of America. Yeah, it's it's like if you hear if you listen to some legal legal brains down here, they're like, I guess he could serve from prison. <laughs> No, like it doesn't. It's so the thing is, it's so fantastical that like people can't actually wrap their minds around it because you're like how this can't America needs to have thought this through. Please. But, like when you think back, I mean, Richard Nixon, like bugged the DNC and did some shady shit. And he was yeah. like, I'm out. Like, yeah. I get it. I'm going. Don't impeach. Me. You know, like. Please, yes. But no, Trump is, uh, he is damming the torpedoes straight into uh, election day. Alyssa, I honestly called you with the hope that you would tell me, like, yes, this is probably going to happen and then we don't have to worry about him and ever again. But you've really let me down. Well, you know what, though? Here's the thing. Please. What I have done is make everybody who listens feel super proud that they live in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I have? Wait, somewhere, somewhere on this, there it is. Exactly. Yeah. Can I tell you what I did? What? I moved to America. Um, I was pregnant with twins who I was going to be raising in America. And so I applied for my American citizenship in hopes that I could get it on time to vote for Hillary. I I just I wanted to vote for the first female president and make that part of my legacy. And then I was uh, ended up being sworn in under Trump. So none of it worked out for me. And now I'm just raising children in this country. And here we are. I'm so sorry. Thank you. I still have Canadian citizenship. Ops as do all my children. So all is not lost. Okay, so can we talk about what's happening now? Because currently, as we speak, Trump is on trial in New York City in a $250 million fraud case. What is this one about? So the accusation is that he has overinflated his net worth by $2.2 billion, with a B, crazy. dollars. Right. And so, like, to give an example, because to be honest, I was like, mm, how the fuck does that happen? Yeah. <laughs> Here is how it happens. Yes. Say his apartment in New York, in Trump Tower, is technically valued at, like, $10 million. Sure. He has said, actually... Mm, I think if I sold it because it's my apartment, I could sell it for a hundred million dollars. And he has done that with all of his properties. Right. Now, 
in theory, like, I don't know, maybe could you buy that? I don't know. Like, would I pay more for JLo's house because she lived in it? Maybe. I don't know. I absolutely would. But right? Trump's, I feel it gets you, you, perhaps the opposite he's, effect. But he's inflated square footage. Mm-hmm. He's inflated uh, a yeah. lot of things. Now, technically, he didn't have to appear in court for this trial at all, but he wanted to. Why? Now, from a campaigning perspective, I actually think it's borderline genius. Like, okay. he's getting earned media. Right. Everyone's following him in and out of the courtroom. He could, he's been doing impromptu press conferences, which are getting sure tons of has. coverage. Yeah. But the best part, Jesse, the best part was when he got all fucking bent and was like, I want to know why I don't have a jury. This is cra- This is rigged. And it's like, dude, it's because your lawyers didn't check the box for a jury. Literally, he complains about not getting a jury. And it comes out that his lawyers forgot to check the box yeah you can't write that no he also did he not he called the judge a trump hating judge which and said he should be disbarred said he should be disbarred oh perfect perfect which i mean i'm not a, a a lawyer either but i would feel like when your fate is in the hands of the judge you should probably try to get the judge on your side or at least not scream that they should be disbarred like right. what is he thinking? But one of the funniest things is that you can tell how weirdly, from a television perspective, serious that Trump is taking this. Yeah, because I need everyone to pay attention. He's one hundred percent been getting blowouts. Like the comb <laughs> over wave is definitely like the use of a round brush is being engaged. Like it is the craziest thing. I'm like, oh my- he. He's the master of television. And even if he is not smart or uh, not a criminal or whatever, he's still he look, he's he's paying attention to detail. He paid attention to that Gwyneth Paltrow trial and he was like, well, she pulled it off with a twelve hundred dollar goop sweater. I'm going to see. He's like, that's it. I'm coming in uh, toned, appropriately made up and blown Mm -hmm. out. Absolutely. I'm sorry. The use of a round brush was engaged is one of my favorite things that's ever been said on this podcast. Thank, Thank you, you so Alyssa. much. Thank you. Oh, my God. You're so welcome. Um, Just before the $250 million fraud case goes to trial, Melania, remember her, uh, quietly renegotiates her prenup, prenup for a third time. Is this just like an OK, asshole, I'll stick with you through this legal drama and another election cycle, but you damn well better pay me on the other side? I mean, Jesse, what else could it be? It's like, I don't care what he did, but I'm going to make sure that Baron and I get all the money. Um, I love that so much. OK, before I let you go, yes. I realize now, having talked to you, that I will probably never be allowed to set foot in the White House. You've walked the halls on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. So I would like to ask you all of the small, petty, inconsequential details I've wondered about this historic American landmark in a rapid fire game I am calling White House Secrets and Services. OK. White House Secrets and Services. Okay, ready for this? Mm hmm. Cue dramatic music. <gasps> what surprised you most when you first stepped inside the White House? How old it is. Oh, how is the lighting for selfies? Actually, pretty good because it's ambient, not too much overhead. Oh, like that. Though I did not let people take selfies. No Instagram or anything like that was allowed uh, in the West Wing when I was deputy chief. That was your rule? I felt it was in- inappropriate. I love that, Alyssa. Mm-hmm. Um, is the toilet paper one ply or three ply? One ply. Oh, I'm so sorry for you and your irritable bowels. Mm-hmm. Is there anything from IKEA in the White House? No. Nothing. No. Not even the Fendi. No. Okay. No. What does the Oval Office smell like? Apples. Oh. The president always had a bowl of a big bowl of apples on his desk. Like if you were sitting down for a meeting, it was like totally acceptable to start chomping on an apple. Like in most cases, not in all cases, but in most cases. Oh, that's so nice. So on the days where you would found that you hadn't eaten all day, could yeah, you, pick would up you an grab apple. an apple? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, what does Barack Obama smell like? Apples? <laughs> 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 I don't know. I've never, you know what? I th- the uh, I think the accurate and appropriate answer is I never got too close to be able to tell. Okay, I like that. Mm-hmm. Also, he wasn't like it wasn't like an overpowering. No, smell he wasn't he like remembered. rolling around in we Paco like- Rabanne in the morning. No. Thank you. Good to know. Okay, Michelle said she used to hear noises in the hallways at night. Is the White House haunted, or was that just you working late? 
probably just us working late. Got it. Um, how often did you hear people talking about aliens? Honestly, never. Good to know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Did you ever watch any White House dramas on the TVs in the White House? Of course. All of them. Really? All of them. Yes, every (gasps) single one. Oh, I love that. Um, Finally, this past summer, a small bag of cocaine was found in the White House while the president was out of town. Who is most likely to have left their coke at work? Wait, what? You don't know this? No. No, there was a bag of cocaine. Yes, you do. Uh, Wait, in the Trump administration? No, in the Biden administration. Oh, shit. God, no, I did not. True story. Did not know that story. I'm just going to go on record and say I broke You White broke House news. Political news. There was a news. bag of cocaine. There was a small bag of cocaine found at the White House in July when Biden was away from the, 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 the there's investigations. Nobody knows whose it is. Oh, my goodness. I would never imagine who oh, no, because you were getting drug tested. Two, of three course times a I month. was. But honestly, the stories of my drug testing are such lore. I'm surprised anyone could go ahead and bring like <laughs> a fucking like schedule whatever uh, drug into the White House. It's wild. Yikes. I can't believe I missed that one. Listen, I can't believe I broke a White House secret to you. You That is how you play White House Secrets and Services. White House Secrets and Services. Alyssa, I don't even know what to... I, I like, admire and respect you so much as a person. Thank you. As a woman, as a sufferer of irritable bowel syndrome. Thank you for being my phone a friend. Can we talk about the election? Can can I come back closer to the election? Yes. Oh, my God. Please do. Oh, that's good. Like That'd so be so far fun. away. That's so far away. Well, I can come back before. Come back during the debates. I'll, debates. I'll, we'll, we can okay. break down debates. We can break down debates. It'll be <gasps> so fun. Did Alyssa Master Monaco just become my official White House correspondent? I did. I did. And I foisted oh myself my on you. And you have no choice oh now God. but to accept me. No. Congratulations to you. This is such a big announcement for you in your career. Thank of you all so of much. Accomplishments, this is probably the biggest. And I'm just so... Wow, 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 wow. Together, we're unstoppable. We're unstoppable. Her best-selling books are called So Here's the Thing and Who Thought This Was a Good Idea, which I uh, bought uh, last week. (gasps) Alyssa, I can't believe I hadn't read it yet. It is so good. I'm tearing through. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. (gasps) Grab yours. They're available wherever books are sold. Her podcast is called Hysteria. It comes out on Thursdays. Follow her at Mastro175 for so many good things, like jam making. I love jam making. Oh, it's a beautiful vibes on that page. Thank you. And now we just have to say goodbye, but it's not goodbye. It's like, it's see you in a few months. See you in a few months. See you in a few months. Yeah, see you in a few months for sure. Thank you. Alyssa Master Monaco, who just agreed, not just agreed, offered to be our official political correspondent here on Phone a Friend. And we accept. Do we not accept, Jason? Uh, accepted. With open arms. Yes. We now have an official tween correspondent, an Oscars correspondent, and a political correspondent. And I think that's all the things you need correspondents for, to be honest. And you better believe she'll be coming back to talk about the U.S. election as it gets closer. What a delight. Thank you, Alyssa, for giving me an episode my father can be proud of. The only one. After the break, Dad, stop listening right now. A phony leaves me an angry voicemail about vaginas. Next. We're back, and I think we should check my voicemail. Check, check, check your voicemail. Hi, Jesse. My name is Kristen, and I'm from Cambridge, Ontario. I wanted to tell you that I love you so much, have loved you since the Hills After Show, and went to see your live show last year, which was great. Uh, I also have three kids, so I enjoy seeing that your life is also a dumpster fire, just like mine. The one thing I wanted to say was that uh, when you were talking about the Naked Attraction show, you were calling the women's vulvas vaginas, and I'm a gynecologist, so one of my big annoyances is when people misidentify female anatomy. So remember, the vulva is on the outside and the vagina is on the inside. Keep up the great work, and I will keep listening. Have a good day. Bye. <gasps> Chris. 
Kristen, the gynecologist from Cambridge, Ontario, as I live and breathe. I love so much about this message. First of all, I love Cambridge, Ontario. My dad grew up there. I spent a lot of my childhood there. I lived with my grandma in Cambridge for a summer. Fact. Love Cambridge. Also, love being told that my life is a dumpster fire. (laughs) It is. Like, really, there's no denying that. Thank you, Kristen. But what I love the most is that a doctor listens to this program. (laughs) A woman who has 12 years of post-secondary education spends her free time listening to me talk about naked attraction. I am honored. I also understand why it would be deeply frustrating for you, an OBGYN, to hear me casually misidentify female anatomy. It's like Evan getting mad at me for misidentifying Travis Kelsey. The frustration is the same. And I have to tell you, I'm just going to admit it. I did not know that. I did not know until you left that message, Kristen from Cambridge, that the vulva was on the outside and the vagina was on the inside. Okay? I thought the whole thing was just the vagina. But no, now I get it. That's why they always talk about the vulva on Naked Attraction. Right? That's why they ask, like, what do you think about the vulva? Because that's technically what we're looking at. The vulva is on the outside. For shame on me. I'm going to pull this up right now, okay? I'm now looking. I'm looking at um, a a, a graph on Google.com of the female anatomy. And what I mean, I'm there are parts I didn't even know existed on my own bits. Oh, my God, Jason, there's something called the vestibule, (laughs) the fourchette. These honestly sound like rooms in Gwyneth Paltrow's Hamptons home, (laughs) Not, not parts of the vagina. This is news to me. I don't know how I could have gone this long and pushed out so many humans from this place without knowing any of this. Three kids emerged from my vestibule and I didn't even know. I'm going to blame my mother. My mom didn't even call it a vagina when I was growing up. She called it a poop a Okay? Like, she wasn't exactly teaching me how to identify the anatomical parts of the poop a It was a different time, you know? It was when Arnold Schwarzenegger was telling all the kids to, you know, not be wimps and moms were calling vaginas poop a But now, Kristen, the gynecologist from Cambridge, Ontario, I will use this as a reminder to one day teach my daughter all about the correct anatomical parts of the vagina, okay? The vulva and the vestibule <laughs> and the fortchette, whatever the hell that is. Thank you, Kristen. I so appreciate that message. I really hope this has been educational for everybody. And honestly, what an episode. Jason, we called Alyssa Mastromonaco to talk about America's biggest dick. And then Kristen called us to talk about Canada's misunderstood vaginas. <laughs> yeah. Full circle moment. Full circle. A journey once again. Jace, we end every episode with a song. I really don't know what it should be this time. I don't know either. We can go Spice Girls to honor the Beckham documentary. Yeah. We could also go Gwyneth Paltrow's iconic duet, Cruisin, from the 2000s film Duets. Or the little-remembered Gwyneth Paltrow cover of Rihanna's Umbrella, which is something that should be brought back into the culture, in my opinion. 100% that one. We're going Gwyneth Paltrow's Umbrella? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, I'm I'm embarrassed. From Glee? From Glee. <laughs> it is a duet between w- Gwyneth Paltrow and Matthew Morrison. It's the two whitest people who have ever appeared on screen together singing Rihanna and Jay-Z's Umbrella. Roll it, Rob. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Chill. Holly. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Good girl gone bad. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Take three. Action. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh. You have my heart. There she is. There she is. Yeah, not a bad vocal. All right, I cannot thank Alyssa Mastromonaco enough. I really do look forward to having her back on because I feel like we just scratched the surface of the White House stories, you know? Huge thanks to all of you for listening, for leaving reviews, and then sliding up into my DMs with thoughts, reactions, opinions, inside jokes after every episode. Uh, The reason I love making this show is you, so please don't stop reaching out. Never stop calling me. Leave me a message anytime at the number in the description of this episode. And now I'm going to walk my walking pneumonia up on out of here. 
Jason, any dinners with billionaires on the books for you this week? Not planned, but you never know. You never know. You never know. I cannot wait to get another creepy photo from you in my text messages. Uh, Talk next Thursday, Jay? Yeah. Feel better. Oh, please. This podcast episode made me feel better. I'm cured. It's a damn miracle. I'm cured. We'll talk next Thursday. Bye. Sing it, Gwyn. Was created by our mom, Jessie Cruxton. The executive producers are Jessie Cruxton and Jason Yanba. The technical producer is Rob Perra. The amazing theme song and sexy interludes are by Jay Melanowski from Badwin Sound Clash. Phone a friend is part of the A cast. Creator Network. Credits are by us, Ray Gatika and Real Gatika. We're her kids. That's crazy, right? Wow, you're still listening? Okay, see you next week.